So this is uh, Hayden Flinner uh, with Georgia Tech and talking about the time difference of arrival localization test bed, uh, development, calibration, and automation. Thank you very much. Cool, thank you. How's everybody doing today? Good, bad? <laughs> cool, so uh, I'm here with Intelligent Digital Communications. We're a VIP team at Georgia Tech. Uh, VIP is an undergraduate research program, so our team is a little bigger than I think most teams I've seen present here today. They're like 10 to 20 people. Um, and as a side effect of that, I did not have a huge part in the DSP part of this presentation, so if you're going to grill me on real hard questions, I'm going to have to refer you to the professor, Dr. Abler over there. Uh, so a little bit of an overview. Today we're going to go over our test bed we have in the stadium and our time of arrival calibration as well as our laboratory test bed. Um, and we're going to go over a website we built to control our test beds because it was going to be a little too much work. So. Um, IDC's purpose is to optimize usage of RF. Um, that's our overall purpose. Now what we've been doing the last few years is to develop localization algorithms for extreme, immenser, extreme emitter density environments like our football stadium, which seats 50,000 people. Um, can't imagine many worse RF environments than that, especially since you got a cell phone, right? You got a cell phone. Everybody's got one, and a lot of people bring two devices, and everybody's trying to use them at once. It gets, it gets pretty noisy in there. Um, so what we've done so far in the stadium is record about 40 terabytes of time-synced uh, RFIQ data uh, for developing some of these algorithms. Um, what we're hoping to do with this data is develop TDOA algorithms. Um, I'm sure everybody's seen the math behind TDOA, time difference of arrival. It's pretty basic. It's pretty old at this point, too. Um, you can see how to do it on this slide here. So first, we're going to go over the stadium test bed. Um, that's a picture of an empty stadium. We were there taking measurements, figure out where exactly all our nodes are so we can do some better math. Um, so before we get into that, we'll get into the actual box we've deployed everywhere. Uh, it's basically just a B200 and all the hardware necessary to run it in a weatherproof box because these are in and around the stadium, like one of them's on top of a concession stand, can only get to it with a ladder, that kind of sucks. Um, th that's why we have the network relay and the power relay so that we can do pretty much everything we need to do remotely without having to climb up there. Um, this is where they're at in the stadium. We've got one in the press box, we've got one on top of the stands. Um, three is like the minimum that you need to localize in a 3D space. Um, we plan on adding more. But for now, we have two laptops that we carry around, too. Um, you, I don't know if you can tell on the slide or not, but everybody's got their hands up cheering. That was not when we lost last week, 41-42. I hope that was a better game, but I, I wasn't there for that one. Uh, so now we're getting to the control center that we built. Uh, I remember at the beginning of the day, Ben asked how many people here knew JavaScript. And I saw like almost no one raise their hands. And somebody told me to put my hand down, though I didn't get volunteered for this website. <laughs> Um, and somebody mentioned that there was like 12 JavaScript frameworks. Our goal was definitely to use all of them, as you'll see in the next few slides. <laughs> so right now we have three, three nodes in the stadium. Our goal is over 10. Um, and so manually logging into these things and running all of our recording commands got pretty out of hand pretty quick, especially because we have games every Saturday or every other Saturday once football season starts. And we record during every football game because that's when the stadium's at its noisiest. Uh, in addition to that, maintaining all the data from all these recordings got really tedious because there's even more data than all football games. So we decided an automated solution would be the easiest way to do this. So this was our uh, minimum viable thing that we thought we'd get away with, was just make a schedule and create some magical website that would schedule it on all our nodes in the stadium um, or in our laboratory test bed. This is what it ended up looking like now. Um, these are just example values. In reality, we cycle through all the different Wi-Fi channels on frequency, but besides that, it looks pretty close to what we do on a game day, except instead of six or seven records, we usually do, I don't know, 50 or so, and they're all about a minute or two instead of five seconds. Uh, we also have done a few other quality of life improvements. We've got a status page, so you can see before you go to schedule things if everything is, is doing well. Um, 
these are all the technologies we use to build this. So we've got Angular and Bootstrap on the front end, which are pretty industry standard. You've probably heard of those before. Um, we use Django for our controller because it pretty much automatically gives you most of what you need bookkeeping wise to build a website. Um, and then we use the pretty standard REST API library to run on our actual RFSNs. And then at its core, what this does is it takes scheduling commands at the RFSN level and it puts them into the Linux at queue uh, to be run at a later time. So with how we manage the test bed done, we're gonna get into actually setting up our lab setup and calibrating our time of arrivals because if your time of arrivals aren't calibrated, then your TDOAs will be all messed up. So why we would want a lab one is should be, should be pretty obvious. I mean, it really sucks to run around the stadium to uh, change where you want your emitter to be. And we can't move the receivers without a drill and a day or two and the athletics approval to cut more holes in the stadium. Um, plus, you know, it doesn't rain inside. So we can have a lab inside to do testing on new algorithms. Uh, this is what it looks like. The uh, three boxes on the left there are basically the same thing we have in the stadium, but in our laboratory. Um, we've got an Edis timing distribution board, syncing them all up, and a delay box for testing different you know, geometries. Um, so as far as why I wanted to calibrate them, since we have B200s, um, you know, they're, not, they're not all exactly identical. Um, and so you're, the amount of delay when a signal hits the USRP to when it's registered as a sample could vary between boxes on probably the owner in nanoseconds, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but as we saw in the earlier um, localization things, at the speed of light, nanoseconds are a pretty big deal. I think I've, I think I've heard, what, is it 30 feet per nanosecond? Sounds about right. Um, so we want to, and we also want to verify that all the TOAs that we're recording to start these calculations are like plausible. So how we determined they were plausible was we check that they were above the kramer rao lower bound, which is basically the theoretic limit given your bandwidth and SNR on how, ac how accurate of a TOA you can, you can give. Uh, these are the equations we used. I, I couldn't tell you how to use those. Uh, <laughs> as expected, with more bandwidth and, and SNR comes uh, a lower kramer rao lower bound, which means more confidence in your results. Um, so. We started our experiment, which was do the TOAs we get vary in an in amount above the Kramer Rao lower bound. Uh, so, this was the experiment we did. We hooked up three receivers to one emitter with no delay, and we collected TOAs on all of them, and then we created TDOAs between all three of those. And you'll see we've got a variance of about 4e negative 5 on, on the variance. Um, and it turns out that is above the Kramer lower bound for our given uh, sample rate and SNR. So good news, we weren't completely unfounded in what we thought our TOAs were. Everything seems to be checking out so far. Uh, so then what we set about doing was calibrating out this delay that you see. So you see we have about 20 nanoseconds mean delay, which shouldn't be right because they're all on the same no delay, right? There should not be any time difference of arrival between any of these three because they're all on the same length cable. So we, we want to calibrate that out. Um, we're not sure where this variance comes from, but we do know it varies every time you restart the USRPs. So what we do now is we calibrate this out every time we start them up for a recording session. Uh, so here's how we set about calibrating it out the first time. We've got four nodes that are on a set length cable, and then we've got two receivers before that delay cable, and one transmitter. So the result is you should have two that have zero delay, and you should have four that have some expected delay. Um, let's see, here's some first results. So how we set this up was we would first start recording without the delay cable, so they were all non-delayed for the first 110 seconds or so, and then we would hook up the delay cable and that way you could see this nice bump in the data from where it should be zero to where it should have the delay. Um, and the way we subtracted out this um, inherent delay to our TOAs was we took that first 100 seconds where it shouldn't have been delayed 
and then we averaged it to get what we expected the, that USRP's particular delay to be, and then we subtracted it from the rest of the TOA vector. And as we, how we determine TOAs was just a simple magnitude interpolation. There's not a slide at the end that'll show you how to do it. It's pretty, it was the easiest algorithm we could come up with. Um, so here's our first set of data. This is over 12 foot. We expected, let's see, a little under 15 nanoseconds. We got around 13. Um, but the good news is our variance on all this was still above Kramer I lower bounds, so it all still seems pretty reasonable. Um, here we've got over 50 feet. All seems pretty logical still. Um, 100 feet, all good. Uh, one thing I will note is, let's see, we've got another one, I think, 200 feet, so that's four different cable lengths. Um, each one of these is the result of four trials at that length, uh, and then we averaged the, every value you see in this table was then averaged across those four runs. Um, all of these came above Kramer lower bounds. All these are pretty close to the expected delay. So we think we've got a pretty good setup here. We can rely on these TOAs. Um, just a little bit of a recap. We've also got that website for running this test bed so we don't have to get our hands dirty with the command line anymore, uh, which is great because our VIP team is mostly undergrads, right? And a lot of them don't have you know, Unix experience. So a website to control is great for them. And we've already got about 40 terabytes of data of time-synced um, RFIQ data. Uh, one thing I, I, I think I left out, so these are all synced on a timing reference, right? Uh, the ones in the stadium are time-synced on GPSDOs. So I believe that's all I brought. Uh, has anybody got any questions? That aren't too DSP, because, you know. <laughs> So did, uh, did you uh, lab test um, the synchronization with the GPS DOs as well, and you still had that um, variance in your uh, time offset, or was that only when disciplined to the PPS? This is only with PPS. Uh, looking forward to this year. I think we're going to try the same experiment in the stadium. Thank you. Any other? Uh, have you geoed any signals in the stadium yet, or is that work left to be done? I believe that's work left to be done because we uh, weren't even sure that we were getting, you know, real real data until we got this experiment done. We've done some early attempts a few years ago, but nothing super promising yet. So you said you're going through, you're cycling through the Wi-Fi channels. Are yeah. you actually going after Wi-Fi? Yeah, is, and that's what, that the, the reason we do that is because our early attempts at localizing, we were trying to localize uh, like a single packet or two. Okay, and, and have then, you verified, uh, your long shot was about 100 yards. Can you, you know? Like, oh, on the, uh, uh, on the lab one? Yeah, I mean, will that it pass all the way? Do you well, think a signal will? So have, this have you is, verified that like, you can actually pick it up at all three from a phone or something like that? Um, we think that we can because I didn't include it, but uh, we've calculated with our um, antenna positioning and the expected power of a cell phone radio. Um, we think we can localize only in the north stands for now is what we're aiming at. That's where our, all, of, all of our antennas are pointed. Um, we think it'll work out. Okay. Do we have any additional questions? Well, in that case, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, guys.